You're now diving into the fish tank. Welcome back to the Fish Tank right here on the Miami Dolphins Podcast Network. Seth Levitt, DJ Preach, and my main man, OJ McDuffie Juice. Juice. Your hat game is crazy right now, man. Hey, what's, going on what's with up, you? Big Seth? Hey, you know, man, I got a big old block head, man. I got to keep <laughs> switching it up so you worry about the hat instead of my head. You feel me? No, I'm, I'm loving that one, man. Representing the state, you know, which we're going to talk a lot about representing your home state today. Um, but the hat looks sweet, uh, you know. So, listen, Juice, you uh, I don't know what strings you're pulling, but somehow we've got another wide out in the tank. Wide you know, out. Not a shocker. We've got more wide outs. This is one, you know, how like in training camp, they start counting roster spots and how many wide receivers can we carry on this squad? We got a whole bunch of wide receivers on this squad, but I, I'm so excited. I'm so excited that you have this interview set up for us today because this is a guy I go back to my first year in 96 was his first year with the Dolphins, but his story is like nothing we've ever had here in the tank. So we got to welcome Charles Jordan, CJ, man. Welcome to the tank. Hey, you guys doing? Thanks for having me. CJ, what up, man? Excited to be here. Hey, man, you know, just take one day at a time, man. Living the dream still. Bro, you're looking good, kid. I can't believe you still got a good hairline, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a whole lot of that here hey, in the well, tank. Right behind me, man. He got what? December second. He's turning fifty, so we got to get ready to party again. I'm going to fifty one now. Fifty one now. Fifty one. Like, right. We got to party again. I was going to do it again. I, I thought fifty it. was forever, Juice. I thought That's you know. Right. You just stop it. Well, I'm not counting twenty twenty anyway. So shit. No, it's, it's a wash. That's right. It's a, good it's a wash, point. man. That's a really good point. I love it. I love it. Well, look, we, there's there's no way we could do anything other than just to dive into this thing with, with you, CJ, because oh. your story is, um, again, it's incredible and it's nothing that you shy away from. And so, like I just said, I met you for the first time in 1996. I was an intern. It was Jimmy Johnson's first year. And, um, you know, I always joke that Juice was the first veteran to talk to me. But the big, uh, you know, Jimmy's big offseason season. Sign, one of his big free agent signees juice was was Charles was, mm-hmm. was Charles Jordan and two things jumped out to me with that right number one was holy shit we just gave a multi-million dollar contract to a guy who's got seven career catches which mm-hmm. that was that in and of itself was was wild but it also was like what does Jimmy know that we don't you know right. and the second thing is um Charles is that it, you know I read this article that Jason Cole had written in the Sun Sentinel it, mm-hmm. it came out in the summer right after the camps where you were just like the flash out there, just, just blowing by guys and your gang affiliations and your story of growing up in LA um, was, was just really kind of mind blowing and, you know, shot multiple times and stabbed and all of this. And, you know, you hear about this, you watch it in the movies, but to have a guy that's in the locker room with everybody else that I'm going to work with every day, he's my coworker, uh, you know, and, and, and you have this story. It was just, it was intriguing. And um, I was curious and I kind of wondered all these things. So, you know, knowing all this, take us back to your life growing up in Los Angeles, how you found the streets or the streets found you, and how Charles Jordan Jr. You're a junior, right? Yeah, how junior, Charles yeah. Jordan Jr. became lucky. Was that was that the name? Was that the street <laughs> oh, name? Yeah. Okay. So we're going off street names. I'm gonna give y'all something to laugh at. So okay. I don't know if y'all can really see this picture right here. That's me sitting in that chair with a red bandana on my head. Ain't you, Mama Star? Can you see that? Oh man, I can't. But you might need to text me. <laughs> so I'm get a little closer to you. Oh. Okay. Wow. wow. Yeah, I can see it now. <laughs> so wow. yeah, so that, that 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 started for me when well growing up we've been there my whole life. I was born in 69 and I was born right there in California, same area. And when I in the fifth grade, it was about 80, 1979, 80, like that was the fifth grade, my dad left. And when he left and moved to New York, he left me with all women in the house to try to become a man. And when he left, I took the streets on as a father figure. I didn't, I didn't have any respect for my dad at that point because I didn't know, I didn't know why he would leave me at that time. So it was just, but my mother would always just tell me, you're not gonna be the first, you're not gonna be the last that the dad's walked out this door, but your life don't stop right there. You know what I'm saying? So she just always tried to keep me pushing. But what I did was I was still a little kid, a little scary little kid, so I was a kid running through school. He pushed me, I'm gonna cry around my sister. And so I just started taking the streets on as a father figure and it kind of led me in a direction of a path I didn't want to go because I'm an extremist. So whatever I try to do, I want to be the best at it. And so when they when they took me to the 
streets of gang violence. It wasn't until me and my sister went to a school that was across the street. Okay, you know where, where the facilities is and you got the price facility on this side and across the street you got the apartment complex. So if you cross over there where the complex is, that's all of a sudden not your neighborhood. Just for one cross over the street, you mm -hmm. on that side, you're in the wrong neighborhood all of a sudden. And we used to get beat up all the time coming home from school. After school. And so I'm like, if I'm gonna get beat up for living in that neighborhood, then I might as well just say, hell, I'm from that neighborhood then. And so from that side off started to start doing that and then you go through these multiple different names and that you try to find one that'll stick to you. Lucky came about because I would always catch a bullet or something and then I'd be lucky that it just missed my heart or it might just miss my head or something like that. So do we play, uh, we'll go to the, I get a case, I get put over and I have a case or something. As soon as I go to court, all the evidence or something is destroyed and all of a sudden I don't have a case anymore. It was just a lot of stuff. So they just started calling me lucky and I said, I guess it carried on. And I just kept the name for a while. We went out to Georgia Tech, and I really showed up, man. It was a lot. Of, it was a lot of good. Uh, it was a couple of good coaches. I think Seattle and the Rams was there as well. And I think I, I had the fastest forty time out of fifteen hundred kids on that one. And man, I, the, the one on ones was amazing, man. I just I was turning kids around. That was just like it was bad. That was really bad. And so after that, man, I went. I went to the next one. They said it's Torrance, California, at El Camino College. So I said, well, I'll be there for that one too. And when I got there, I started. I think I was starting a bench press. And I always try to be the first one to do my reps or whatever it is in each group. But the owner of the scout camp, Steve Austin, came to me and said, Chuck Charles, get up. You don't, have to, you don't have to do none of this today. Somebody's here today. All they want to see you run is a 40, but I can't tell you who it is. But that's not helping me. But I said, okay, but then I go sit over here. He said, and you're going to be in the last group. I said, man, I got to sit there for five, six hours <laughs> just to be in the last group to run a 40? <laughs> but I did it. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, the first time I ran a 40, I asked the guy, he, um, what was the fastest time? He said, like, 4 3 five or something like that it was the fastest today. And I said, oh, I'm gonna beat that. And the only thing I took off was my shirt. I didn't take my sweats off. And I ran the first one and my daddy timed it. He was yelling, turn the four, two, four, two, four, two. And I'm like, okay, but he was really high. And then, and then I'm walking back. They said, you took off too fast, man. We couldn't we couldn't get the stopwatch and stuff to start. I said, but I thought you got the bean down there. You know what I'm saying? So what you mean? No problem. They said, take 10 minutes and do it again. So I didn't need the 10 minutes. I'm gonna get down there, I'm gonna take my sweats off and run it again. They said, no, have me minutes. here for five hours. I don't need 10 fucking minutes. Yeah, no, I'm ready to go, man. I'm the last one I ain't running for. Ain't nobody else out here, man. It's just, I see 30 people down there with stopwatches. And I'm like, man, that's a lot of people just for me. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I got a big head going a little bit. I see 30 people, man. I'm like, shit, I got a chance to do something great. So then, hey, you know, I brought the best out of me, man. I ran the same time I did it again and again and again. I ran it three times. And then when I, all them scouts ran to me, and then when this one guy walking up, all them walk away. And I'm like, for this one dude now, I'm pissed off because I like the attention. I was like, what are these gonna sign me? If I got 30 people here besides one, somebody I might get a job. Man, that dude said, how would you like to play for the Raiders? I kind of snapped too. I said, but I would love to, man. But I keep talking to a dude named George Cares. He said, he don't do it. He said, I am George Cares. <laughs> and then my heart started doing this. <laughs> my heart started beating. He said, man, I am George Cares, man. He said, okay, I, I just gonna see about myself. What this all humble to Bob about you? Tell me what you can do or something. But he thought story straight, man. When I pulled up, he said they don't give me a card to the draft. That was the scariest line of my life. Like how I felt like I was waiting on my name to be called at the draft. Cause I'm like, I want to see what the Raiders are gonna take to see if they really will need the opportunity to come in. Man, they all of a sudden he goes, so duh, 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 duh. Canada, Toronto's go bankrupt. They can't keep rocking this mail to the off side of this Raiders. They have his rights. I'm like, oh fuck. Then they got Rocket. <laughs> then they got Orlando Truitt in the third round. And then they took James Jett, Olympic track star, you know what I'm saying? I'm sitting like, oh my God, we got Tim Brown, we got Willie Gaw, wow. and I pull up, I see James Lofton, man, we had Stan Gray, man, we had a track team, man. It was like 13 receivers, then they tell us, then you're a key fighter. I'm like, well, you just gave 23 million, I was at the right dude where I found one too. I'm doing right, you got Willie Gaw, you got a million dollars. I'm looking at the shop like, well, I don't see how this is gonna work out, you know, for anybody, but then he told me, he said, well, we just see, okay, long story short, one day go by, they signed all the people, signed the free agents they were here. Charles Jordan didn't know where to the next day go by. No call. The third day come, still nothing. And I went to the shoebox, grabbed my little mail water box. Well, look like this didn't work out for the wrong one. As soon as I lit it, my buddy said, the phone ringing. I said, who is it, man? He said, the call ID say, uh, man, say Los Angeles ring. I'm like, this. I'm like, I'm like, God, what still I put that thing out so fast, man? Look at I went in there and called it was George Cares, man, telling me to be at the shares uh, three days from now. To be at the shares, they have a rookie camp. They're going to bring me in for rookie camp, man. That was, oh, man, my heart just was pounding so fast. I was so excited, wow. man. And then when I, went into, when I went into that camp that day, man, I, honestly, I felt like throughout that whole process, 
I looked at, I, this is where the gang stuff for me came to play. I felt like all, everybody in that building was all Crips and I'm the only blood in there. I gotta do, I gotta outdo all of them. Cause all y'all, we all looking for the same job. So if you in this wide receiver room, I don't wanna be your friend. You know what I'm saying? Cause we fighting for the same job right now. That's how I felt cause I was looking at everything they had. And the first time we get up to that practice field, we did one-on-ones. After the second round, Al Davis said, come here, take me upstairs. They took me upstairs and I didn't practice no more for the three days at rookie camp. I just did one-on-ones on that first Friday or Saturday morning. And after that, he took me upstairs and said, you come back tomorrow morning at 8 30, you know, sign my two year contract. You just talked a little bit about Howie Long, man, which is out. Oh, yeah, but oh, I meant to say about that. I said, I'd like to say this. Howie was working with Fox, and, and he was working with Jimmy. And me and Jimmy started off kind of bumpy in 96. Uh, first player training camp, uh, JB Brown and fell on my ankle and kind of gave me a fracture, a, high, a bad fracture. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really walk on it, but Jimmy and KO would make me practice every day. Anyway, I'm leaving the building on crutches. Can't put no pressure on it. But every morning I'm coming in on crutches, can't put no pressure on it. But then when it's time to go on the field, they take me up and tell me to go out. Long story short, I stopped doing that, upset at Jimmy. So we had a problem. Jimmy had Fox come when we I forgot what game we was playing, but they worked it. Howie Long came, you know, Jimmy was stretching one day. Howie said, Come on, let me talk to you. He walked me to the side. He got in my ass, man, real bad. And he was just telling me about relationships and why I was there. And then he was like, How many stacks? What he asked about my stacks. He said, So when when it was time for Jimmy to get you, I told Jimmy to come get you. Because I said, man, this kid right here, play with him. And I told him about how you destroyed our defense when you was on that scout team and got us ready each week. And we couldn't stop you. We knew what you was running. You know what I'm saying? And so when Howie said, so he said, I need for you to be a professional mm -hmm. and stop with the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? He broke it down to me, right? And so when I realized that that was a call that he made with Jimmy to do that, I felt obligated to do right by Howie for speaking up for me like that. But yeah, Howie did that for me, man. He did, he told Jimmy to come. So, I'll, tell you so, what, I'll tell you what I did get from that though. And been around Juice and some of these guys who was young professionals at the time. I did, if there's anything I can take back, is do, do, do a redo, a, a do over, right? It would be my attitude. It would be being so arrogant, so cocky. I would, I would do away with that. And I would do more of being a professional than feeling like it's the streets, okay? Because it's two different things, this is your job. Just that mentality because, was still there, right? I yeah, mean, that's but the, really the, the thing for me was, I grew up to where your word is everything to me. So when you tell me something, I'm gonna give you what I promised I'm gonna give you, but I need you to do what you say you're gonna do to me. And that's not, football's not that. That opportunity to play for 13, to play with 13, to be in the huddle with him, that was something that was, he, he, as good as you knew Green Bay was, that was worth it to you. To, to move you know on. what, I feel like I've always believed in Dale. So to me, I was like, hey, I come here, we play. Hey, Jimmy Johnson, now he got the pedigree, you know what I'm saying? He's done took that Dallas there. Then you put that with Dan Marino, he can fix this around. They was already close a couple years before that anyway. So I'm like, Miami going too. So I just end up playing them in the Super Bowl. I didn't work out like that. But hey, at the end of the day, it was like, I'm going to take that 13 because 93 and 94, Brett didn't come on the scene to 92. Remember, because Magic right. got hurt, and then Brett right. came in and had the killer. So 92, 93, 94, that's, he won MVP 93, which was fine. But <laughs> it's fine. No, 94, 94, which was fine. But I'm still like, that's 13, though. I'm going 13. I'm taking my chance with that. So right. I, yeah, so I mean, I, would, I, would, I, would, I love Green Bay. One of the best places I love to play at. But I was taking my chance with that. So well, I'm going to tell you like you told James Lofton, where he gave you the Stanford answer and you wanted the football answer. You gave me the football answer, and I want the life answer here. So, so that's the football reason why Dan Marino. But again, you weren't supposed to be there, CJ. Like everything that happened here, you said people in your neighborhood didn't live past 15. If they lived past 18, it was all on borrowed time. You're fucking catching passes from Dan Marino. Like, does that ever? Are you just numb to that? Like, you are the violence, the the yeah, fact I, that I, you've I, had I never... all this success, or do you sit back and go? Did you ever catch yourself in a in a huddle and look around and go, look, you know, I, I could I could be in a car, you know, with someone who's going to go try and take somebody out right now, and instead I'm staring at Dan Marino about to catch a touchdown pass. Like, did you ever have that moment? No, I mean the problem because my life is so messed up, man. And I just praise God that I'm even still be here today because the things that's in my head, it definitely ain't that. You know what I'm saying? And what it, for me was only thing that was in my head was I didn't appreciate what was given to me. I didn't appreciate being there yet. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't mature enough 
to understand where I really was because the shit came too easy. You see what I'm saying? I didn't have to go to yeah. college. I didn't have to do all this extra stuff. All of a sudden, I didn't know nothing about that. All I did was I got on that phone, I was persistent. I'm an entrepreneur by trade. So I'm sitting up there, I'm gonna talk for myself. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna call every team, I'm gonna ask every team. And when I got the chance, I mean, I bust my ass. I ain't gonna say I didn't bust my ass. I don't want nobody to take that wrong on what I'm saying because I feel like I worked harder than the next man in front of me every single day. Right. So whoever was in front of me or side by me, I try, I'm, I'm sure that I was putting in the work to be there. But I hear I you. Working hard and about. appreciating the moment are two different things. So I totally right. understand what you're saying. Yeah. But I just didn't never, honestly, man, I never thought about that. I didn't even look at Reggie White being there. I didn't look at Howie Long being there. As Think a, about as, that. These, yeah, are, these people will live forever, you yeah. know, in Canton. These are, these are the ghosts of football forever. And you were with them after surviving what you survived that's the thing for me but but what i'm also hearing man is like what you said how it was the old heads the guys that were serving life in prison were the guys that were telling you forget the streets and go to school it wasn't the guys in it and i almost feel like you're at that place now right like now you can reflect but in the moment i reflect yeah i reflect like, remember, like I said, remember one thing please take take, take remember that my life was going so fast man you know what i'm saying like Things was happening so fast around me. Yeah. It, I was living on a treadmill. You know what I'm saying? My life was moving on a treadmill. Constant, no stop, no stop. And the hardly sleep at night, maybe two, three hours of sleep every day. You know, going, 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 going. So I didn't have no chance to really sit back, man. I think that time, I promise you, I think the day that I really, one day that I really realized what I was, what I was doing when it was all gone. I really look back and say, man, do you, man? Not, no, man, not, not you, right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, Looking at some videos, some film that NFL film send you, they send you highlights stuff. You look at that, you're like, man, that was really me. And then you look at that, and you're like, man, why you didn't appreciate that more? And then you had to talk with your son, you know what I'm saying? And he explained to them, you know, how you don't take life for granted. Don't take the moments for granted. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to appreciate the things that God put before you, and you got to work to keep that. Don't ever had a talk about the devil in the history.